episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Be meeting up again with uh, our friends at Microsoft uh, with another truly fascinating guest for us. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Dr. James Weinstein, who is Senior Vice President of Microsoft Healthcare, uh, where he is in charge of leading strategy, innovation, and health equity functions at the company. Uh, previously to Microsoft, Dr. Weinstein was the President and Chief Executive Officer of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, a $2 billion academic medical center in northern New England, uh, where he led the organization to adopt the population health model, including transition from fee to serve for, for service to global payment structure. Uh, prior to becoming CEO, Dr. Weinstein also served as president of Dartmouth Hitchcock Clinic and was the director of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice, home of the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, which for decades has documented the ongoing variations in healthcare delivery all across the United States. Uh, Dr. Weinstein is a founding member and inaugural executive director of the National High Value Healthcare Collaborative, along with the Mayo Clinic, Intermountain Healthcare, the Dartmouth Institute, and Denver Health. Uh, the Collaborative is a partnership of health systems that have taken on the challenge of improving the quality of care while lowering cost across a national scale. Uh, Dr. Weinstein is a member of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. He's held the Peggy Y. Thompson Chair in Evaluative Clinical Sciences at the Diesel School of Medicine while at Dartmouth. He's also a Senior Fellow for the Healthcare Center and Clinical Professor at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth and a Clinical Professor of the Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern University. Uh, Dr. Weinstein is also a member of the Special Medical Advisory Group for the National Veterans Administration, serves on the Board of Trustees for the McClag Florida Institute for Neuroscience, the Intermountain Health System, and Imagine Care, which is a company started while Chief Executive Officer to use remote sensing uh, to manage patients outside the traditional brick and mortar medical system, and serves on several other boards as well. Uh, throughout his career as a researcher uh, and renowned spine surgeon, Dr. Weinstein has received more than $70 million in federal funding, published more than 325 peer-reviewed articles, and continues as editor-in-chief of Spine, uh, the Journal of Spine Surgery. Uh, Dr. Weinstein also serves on the board of the Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute, uh, which is a Department of Defense program using stem cells and various other biosubstrates to ultimately print artificial organs. Uh, when he's not doing all that, he's an accomplished author uh, with his book, Unraveled, Prescriptions to Repair a Broken Healthcare System, uh, which you can find on Amazon. Uh, all that being said, welcome Dr. James Weinstein to the show. Great to be with you, Aaron. Nice, to, Nice to see you. Definitely. They're great to see you, and it's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, you know, we typically start off the show by, by handing our guests the floor for a little while, just so we, we can get to know you a little bit better. If you could uh, just take a little time to, to go back a little bit to the beginning, sort of, you know, where you grew up, uh, how you first got interested in, in science, in, in chemistry, in medicine, uh, and a little bit of your journey through both uh, academia and in the industrial sectors today. That would be a great way to... Uh, to start off and lay the ground. Thanks, Sarah. I'll try, try and be brief, but I think it's important for the listeners to understand, despite all that tremendous introduction, um, I've worked pretty hard <laughs> since I was a kid. Um, I worked in a factory loading and unloading trucks uh, all the way till I was a third year medical student. So I worked in the inner city of Chicago, um, where race issues were common then as they are now. Um, uh, I love sports. Uh, I wrote my college essay on uh, supporting the Chicago Cubs who were always losing until recently. So how it was to support a losing team for 30 years. Um, so I, I think I've been really blessed. I, I met the love of my life while working at the Shriners Hospital for crippled children. Uh, Mimi, and uh, she's made me a, a better person. Uh, we have two daughters. Uh, our youngest daughter is a physician in Boston taking care of COVID patients right now. She's had over 1,200 uh, COVID patients. Uh, she's a pulmonary intensivist, a fellow right now at the um, uh, Boston Medical Center and uh, part of her time at the Brigham. Um, our oldest daughter passed away from leukemia at age 12. And uh, so my wife and I had a very difficult time. Uh, she was diagnosed with uh, leukemia uh, just after turning one. And she had five relapses, um, made it to age 12. 
spent most of those 12 years in therapy, either chemotherapy or radiation. Um, I never missed a visit with my daughter. She always wanted me to start her IVs because uh, she trusted me. Um, I was a spine surgeon. Uh, my practice was uh, doing spine tumor surgery, which is very complicated and had never really been done in any classification uh, scheme. So I developed a scheme working with some colleagues around the world on how you actually do take out spine tumors and preserve people's function and spinal cord. I was a researcher, did the largest NIH trials for spine care. Um, an author, as you said, did a lot of scientific work on pain and function. And uh, just really privileged to join Microsoft uh, after a long career in healthcare to help look at where should Microsoft go in healthcare as a tech company. So I think that's been the journey. Uh, lots of bumps in the road. Uh, I've had my shares of great things and great tragedies, as you've heard. So I, I wrote that hopefully that helps the listeners. Absolutely. And I appreciate you sharing that, Jim. And the, um, you know, in your book, uh, Unraveled, uh, you you go into, you know, at the beginning, this very touching story about your daughter, Brianna, and sort of the, uh, not just the struggles that you had as, uh, well, she struggled, you as a, as a family struggled with the leukemia, but uh, you struggled against the system, not just uh, in uh, trying to make certain sort of pharmacotherapeutic decisions, but, you know, deciding whether to continue therapies, try alternative therapies, and you really, uh, you outline this. And, and it, it was these experiences that led to uh, you developing uh, initiatives like the Center for Shared Decision-Making and, and the High Value Healthcare Collaborative at, um, at Dartmouth. Can you just take us a little bit on sort of this path, if you would, and, and how some of these initiatives came to fruition because of your personal journey? Yeah, thanks, Ira. Yeah, so, you know, obviously I had the journey uh, with our daughter, which was 12 years. So it was a very difficult journey. Um, and I saw, you know, we all see this with our parents, but it's different with your child. And um, I saw in my own profession too much spine surgery being performed. Um, I saw the work I did with Jack Winberg at the Dartmouth Institute uh, on the Dartmouth app was seeing tremendous variation in delivery of care across the country. Um, and then I just saw it every day with my daughter that sometimes it was just an experiment. And you don't want your child to be an experiment. Nobody wants to be an experiment. And so I spent a lot of time looking at ways to change what was informed consent which is really a doctrine of assault. And I don't believe doctors want to assault their patients, but trying to change that to a doctrine of informed choice. And so we opened the first in the world shared decision-making center to give people information and hearing from other patients, their stories about the good, bad, and ugly of the potential treatment. Should a breast cancer patient have a lumpectomy or mastectomy? Whose choice should that be? What's the evidence to support that? If lumpectomy is just as good as mastectomy, shouldn't the woman or man be able to make that choice themselves? Back surgery, should you have it, should you not? Prostate surgery, is it better than watchful waiting? Who should decide that? And so I've spent a lot of time developing tools to empower patients, which is, by the way, what Satya Nadal is trying to do at Microsoft, is empower people with tools. I was trying to empower patients with information to make informed choices rather than informed consent. And so the path I took was all about that and still is, and to that extent, I did the largest trials in the country on spine surgery and showed that you could not have spine surgery and do pretty well in many cases. But patients are afraid when they have pain and dysfunction and they say, I've got to do something. I can't stand that. Do something compared to what and when and how and with whom. 
And the other thing I, I thought about is if you go to a doctor and your listeners can think about this themselves, how many doctors have you gone to who can actually tell you the results of their treatments? And I always ask this question in every lecture and I never get a hand raised. We know more about what's in a cereal box than we do than it's what's in our doctor's office. If every day we get on airplanes and we fly them because we trust the pilots and the instruments to tell us that the plane's working, what do we use in healthcare? What are those instruments? What's our, our instrument dashboard that helps us to decide? And we don't have that in healthcare and that's not acceptable. Now that you, uh, you know, you transitioned from uh, your role at Dartmouth, major academic uh, medical system, you're now at Microsoft, um, major tech player, and, you know, we've discussed this uh, theme uh, on previous shows of what we'll call convergence, health tech, or, move, you know, merging the best now of, of what you've learned in healthcare with uh, cutting-edge technologies. I'd like to walk through some of these topics uh, where you think uh, not just the, the, the concept, but also maybe some of the tools that you're developing may have impact. And I'd like to start obviously with the one that you are most passionate about, of course, this focus on uh, value and outcome centric care as opposed to uh, more traditional models. Talk a little bit about some of um, uh, the projects, if you would, that you're most excited about. And then if you could talk about uh, some of the tools that you envision as being important in this endeavor. We talked uh, you know, a few months ago to Tom Laurie with the artificial intelligence uh, group at Microsoft. What are some of the things you see uh, potentially bringing to the table where you can really improve on this, this value outcomes concept in, in, in care? I, I hope, Ira, the first thing we bring is humility. Um, healthcare is not just technology, it's people. So let's be clear that Microsoft or other major tech companies need to have humility. They need to have transparency. They need to have trust. They need to understand who owns the information that they're working with. And some of these principles, Sachin Nadal and my colleagues at Microsoft take extremely seriously. Trust is what Microsoft's all about, which is what I really like. You, you have data, it's not Microsoft's data. It's your data. We don't want your data. We want to help put your data in a space that it's safe and secure, cybersecurity issues. We want to put data in a place that becomes useful to N equals one, every person, but N equals 7 billion people on the earth. How can we help the world at N equals one levels to get what they need when they need it with the best outcomes at the lowest cost in a way that they can understand? So, so we have lots of interesting tools you know, robotic tools, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these are fantastic words. They mean nothing to the patient. Once a patient hears they have a diagnosis of cancer, that they can't remember anything else you say. So at Microsoft, we have to have the tools that sit in the background. One such tool might be called ambient clinical intelligence. What does that mean? That means as you talk to your phone, you can talk to your doctor and it can listen. It can transcribe what you talk about with your permission. Oh, by the way, over 90% of patients have granted us their permission. That's very important. We shouldn't just be listening without their permission. So I, I encourage the listeners to make sure who's listening when you're having an intimate doctor's visit and how that information is going to be utilized and who owns it. And I think Microsoft does those things extremely well. I'm sure Tom talked about artificial intelligence and our ether network and our values and 
all those kinds of things. But what I'm looking at is how do our sophisticated platforms and tools empower the persons in that room with the least friction possible? It's already hard enough to make even an appointment to see your doctor, let alone have enough time to talk with them, have an explanation to make an informed choice. So what I'm really pushing for and pushing hard on Microsoft is, I love all the gadgets, but how do they make my patient's life easier, my life easier as a practitioner, as a nurse, as a social worker, as a guard in the facilities? And so Microsoft's thinking hard about those issues. And, and I, I'm most pleased that we take privacy, security, and transparency as key principles in everything we do. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, obviously, a um, a hot topic nowadays, uh, right now, as we're talking, um, you know, as the, as the Pfizer and, and Moderna vaccines get closer to approval, there's obviously this discussions about uh, equity and, and how this potential vaccine is going to be uh, distributed amongst the, the 7 billion, as you mentioned. Uh, you, aside from everything you do at Microsoft, you are very focused on health equity. You always have been. You are part of the National Academy of Medicine's uh, Committee on Community-Based Solutions to promote health equity. Uh, talk a little bit about um, health equity, if you would, from a Microsoft perspective and, and some of what you envision there. Yeah, so one of the things I talked to Microsoft about when I joined was I want us to talk about equity. This is before, you know, everything became, you know, noisy in the country the last couple of years. Um, and I was privileged to lead an effort uh, for the National Academies, as you said, with a very diverse panel. And we studied 110 cities in the country and looked at every community is different. And just like N of one patients, you can't take Philadelphia and say that's like Baltimore. And you can't take Chicago and say that's like Los Angeles. And you certainly can't say any of those are like Hanover, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth is. And so as we have solutions around equity in this country, we can't have one set of solutions. The United States is famous for you know, we're all in and we'll spend tons of money, but we really don't solve the problem. And, and equity is one of them. Um, so disparities in this country are not new. It's not a new thing. From the Dartmouth Atlas work, I've been privileged to be involved with over 20 years. The south part of our country, the rust belt of our country, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Florida, these disparities are have existed for decades. What I'm really tired of is seeing my own Dartmouth maps that show we haven't affected that disparity at all. So one of the reasons I joined Microsoft was twofold. One is we're working on things like adaptive biotechnologies, which is around T cells. And T cells, uh, every T cell has a story and every blood, tube of blood has a million T cells. And when you start to apply AI to T cells and machine learning, you can actually tell what's happening in a person's body before they get sick and also develop cures. And oh, by the way, our daughter would be alive today with those discoveries. So that's one of the reasons I joined Microsoft. Another reason is that we're actually thinking about how we can actually help patients in this COVID time. So, so just as adaptive biotechnologies worked on T cells for cancers, like pancreatic cancer or leukemias, it also is the best COVID test. It's not publicly available, but has the best sensitivity and the best specificity of any test currently on the market. And you asked about um, Moderna, and, and Pfizer with the vaccines. This is a really interesting time, and I know there's a lot of political noise. I, I've been privileged to be in those spaces for decades. 
this isn't a time for noise. This is a really complicated problem. I'm sure it is in Philadelphia. Even in Hanover, New Hampshire, it's complicated. What we need to do is not create more complexity with noise because we know the inequities that exist in African-American and Hispanic populations who've been much more susceptible with higher mortality rates than others was, was not unpredictable. But we didn't get ahead of it. And even though, knowing that, so I'm calling for a national response called a Federal Health Authority. The, um, the Federal Reserve came to be in 1907 because of financial problems and didn't get enacted until 1913. The Federal Reserve is meant to protect the country from the 2008s or the depression so that banks don't become insolvent. We need to do the same thing in healthcare and we need to take healthcare out of politics like the banking industry is and create the federal health authority. The, at, the absence of good data with understanding what's happening across the country is our own fault and is solvable with the federal health authority taking it out of politics with oversight by the executive and Congress but like the Federal Reserve allows us to create a cushion for health systems and to regulate all this diagnostic testing, all the PPE that's necessary, that for every dollar we charge in healthcare, we could charge 0.3 cents and support this. I mean, it's a minimal charge, just like the Federal, um, um, Federal Reserve is to keep the banking industry solvent. So with Pfizer and with Moderna, their results are almost too good to be true. They're, present, they're proposing 90% effectiveness. I have lots of questions. I hope that's right. Some of these are synthetic um, vaccines, different than before. We couldn't have done this without the push of Congress and the executive branch to invest the dollars, which is fantastic but we're leaving small businesses behind because of politics. We're leaving people behind because of politics and healthcare is affected by politics. And so I'm hopeful that Moderna, Pfizer, and many others will be extremely successful to give a vaccine out, but we can't have it where the virus in a baseball game is scoring one and the people are scoring zero. We're gonna lose every time unless we prepare ourselves with the infrastructure that places like Microsoft and others are building, working with pharma like Pfizer and Moderna and many others. But we need a federal health authority to put this together and take this out of politics as a nation. I'm sorry for the long answer, but this uh, bothers me. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Um wholeheartedly and you know you bring up a lot of fascinating points that uh unfortunately don't get mentioned in the uh uh in the mainstream media but um yeah no i i, I definitely appreciate that and um you know just stepping uh, continue along that just for one more moment you you um you know you, you wrote this uh paper recently uh the essential role of technology in public health battle against COVID 19 and obviously um well, most people are aware that even after you know these vaccines are approved and we all get them, it's not the end of the, the problem. We have obviously all the the trickle down health issues from everyone that's had COVID. Plus, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the coming years, whether this is a once and done or um, any other interesting insights with regard to your thoughts on on COVID and then obviously health tech uh, as uh, you know stopping COVID twenty or twenty one uh, coming down the pike. Well, I think there'll be more COVIDs, just like flu, um, and we, we have to be better prepared for that. Um, I, I'll tell you some interesting stuff we did. We worked with a company called Nant uh, Technologies, and um, they were interested in protein folding, um, which needs really high-speed computer uh, capabilities, and Microsoft has that, of course. And what we were looking at with them, what they were really looking at with our technology was the binding sites 
for the spike protein for COVID, which then helps design a vaccine, which then speeds up a product to market with greater reliability that might be effective. So I think this whole space of protein folding and using high-speed computing, what that actually means to the listener and the consumer is we can do things now in weeks that used to take a year, right? So our ability, just as we're seeing with these vaccines coming to market fast, with knowing what these uh, binding sites are in vitro outside of normal humans, can help us design these kind of products a lot faster. So it's really exciting, but I, I still worry that the agendas aren't aligned and the incentives aren't aligned. And when it comes to healthcare, we have to have one nation um, and we have to not have inequities. And we wrote a paper early that you may have seen, Ira, for Health Affairs, where we took Dartmouth Atlas-like data and predicted back in March and April what parts of the country and who was at greatest risk. And unfortunately, it all turned out right. So we knew as a nation ahead of time, if we use the information, where we had to protect our, our loved ones in nursing homes those with more chronic diseases, those who can't social distance. You know, all these things are predictable. And yet, you know, closing bars at 10 o'clock, the virus doesn't go to sleep at 10 o'clock. And, and, and so I don't understand some of the thoughts. So forgive me and I'll probably get a lot of complaints, but you know, some of this stuff is common sense. And I'm not criticizing because this is extremely difficult and it's always easy from the cheap seats to look back, but we can do a better job. And, and so I'm excited about what Microsoft's doing. I think the principles are right, the values are right, and the focus is right. And I, I'm excited that you're there doing it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, but when you're not there, well, you're at Microsoft, you're, you're involved with the National Academies of Medicine, and you also uh, happen to be a board member of um, Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute. Uh, we had uh, Alex Titus on uh, a couple weeks ago uh, talking about some of what's going on there. Now, obviously, you spent a decent part of your career, you're uh, a specialist, as you mentioned, in, in uh, spinal uh, cord cancers, in degenerative diseases of the spine. Uh, I'm just, I'd love to have your, you know, we talked about hearts and kidneys a, a couple weeks ago, but I'd love to hear some of your uh, future visions for regenerative medicine, specifically as it relates to the spine and some of the, the, the stuff that you're looking forward to seeing coming out of uh, ARMI. Yeah. So ARMI, A-R-M-I, is Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing. Manufacturing. Sorry. Manufacturing. So the goal is how do you take stem cells and mass produce organs, right? So the Department of Defense is looking at nobody should be without a, a limb or kidney. And, and, you know, so our soldiers who get injured, can we replace parts? And the answer, I think, is yes. And we're making tremendous progress. So organoids, so how do we make organoids, a pancreas or a brain cell or, or a kidney, as you suggested? It's probably modular. You can get these stem cells and have them turn into pretty much what you want them to be just from your own fat. So you don't have the rejection issues. You can use your own tissue. But then... The exciting part, and I think where Microsoft and other tech companies come into play, there's so much data because we have to create the environment that not just creates this organ or organoid, but it also has to survive. So it needs a blood supply. What kind of forces need to act on that? What's the chemical environment for that organoid to optimize? And then once you make one, where, how do you transport it to the person who needs it fast enough why it's alive? And so there's just some really interesting stuff happening around this whole new space, which I think will be you know, part of the next industrial revolution in the United States around science, technology. But it's scary. And the scary thing to me is, 
and part of why I'm excited, it's scary because this is like science fiction in some ways. Um, you know, Star Trek with the recorder uh, and, you know, the T cells and making the diagnosis. And here we are now making new organs. But when you talk about equity, we can take care of everybody this way, right? And it doesn't matter what your background is. We can use your cells, make an organ for you just in time for you. So, so I'm really excited about this. I don't think it's 10 or 20 years away. I think it's five to 10 years away. And so, so we need to make these investments. We need to have the data. But Army is one of those projects under Dean Kamen's leadership. Um, that's just totally exciting, totally exciting. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Jim, coming back to you, um, you know, we typically ask a, a wrap-up uh, question uh, to our guests about important influencers and mentors over the course of their career. Uh, obviously, uh, Brianna was a major um, influence on everything you've done. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, your family as well. Um, Obviously, you've met a variety of people from industry, from academia, uh, from government. Uh, any in, people that you might want to mention, shout out to, uh, obviously, not everybody, but uh, anyone that you really feel that you want to uh, just mention at this point that, uh, you know, if it wasn't for them, uh, Dr. James Weinstein would be doing something totally <laughs> different right now as opposed to what your, your passions yeah. are now. So, so the usual... I have a picture in my office of a glass. You could, it's a cover from New York or from the 70s. And it looks like a glass that's half full of orange juice. And I would ask people uh, when they came in my office, why do I have that picture there? It was the only picture besides my family I had. And people would say half glass full, half glass empty. And of course, that's not why I had it. Because as somebody who's been privileged to be in my position, I usually get all the problems as a leader. What I need are solutions. And so I'd ask them about that glass and I'd get all kinds of answers, but the answer was it was the wrong glass. And so when you ask me who's made a difference for me, besides my family, my parents, my sister, my brother, my wife, my daughter, you know, it's some of the people that you wouldn't have imagined people on the street, a guy I worked with in the factory who was never gonna get out of that space, but drove me home every day. And how he drove me home was he'd have one foot in the gas and one foot on the brake because his car was gonna die out if he took his foot off the gas. And the smoke was coming out the, you know, the, the tailpipe. And what he impressed me by was every day he showed up. He showed up um, to do the best job. And sometimes we as a country don't show up. And you don't, have a have, you don't have to have a lot to show up. But you gotta show up and give it your best. And so the, I've had tremendous physics professors who smoked in class all day, but I learned physics, you know? And neurosurgeons that operated that smoked and I, you know, love them. But this guy who drove me to work every day, who I worked side by side in the factory, who, you know, had a limp because he hurt his leg and had polio as a child, he showed up every day to help me. So I've been trying to show up to help others my whole life. That's the point. Let's help each other. Wonderful message, wonderful message. Um, Jim, it's been inspiring and uh, eye-opening listening to your story and really wishing you the best at uh, everything you're going to be doing uh, at Microsoft. Um, for everybody that's going to be watching this particular episode on the YouTube channel or listening across the various uh, podcast networks, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. James Weinstein, Senior Vice President, Microsoft Healthcare, doing really amazing things for value-added health outcomes and health equity. Uh, Jim, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you.